we have about a, a half an hour for for questions, and uh, and and we'll go uh, straight to those. I think what I'll do is I'll try to take um, four or five uh, questions, and we'll let the then let the panel respond, and and then we'll we'll do that again until either we run out of time or the process ex exhausts itself. Um, so uh, breaking with tradition, we'll start with the right hand side of the room, and uh, uh, does anybody want to uh, pose a question to to the group here? Hi, James Thurlow from you and you Wider. I was I was just thinking about your um, the indicators that you're using, Joshua. So your, the indicators you were using, um, uh, and of course some of your governance indicators are about a willingness to respond and so on. And you do have some indicators about uh, distance to nearest clinic or something like that. But I was thinking about remoteness and whether or not um, the the high re higher resolution road data might be one way of 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 showing a potential speed of response to to a particular crisis. Um, Tony Ellison from You Knew Wider. Uh, very interesting um, presentation. Um, on the sort of first part, on the, uh, the relationship between um, climate and environment and, and conflict, um, there's sort of two questions here. Really, I think you were moving to a sort of policy prescription whereby if you can overlay where the the projects are and the investments across the maps and then you can overlay the information about conflict and um, climate change vulnerability and so forth. You've got quite a powerful tool to guide policy makers. Um, I can see the value in that. Uh, there is of course the substantive issue about well if the rate of return on any projects in those areas is is going to be pretty low and actually may decline with climate change itself. Whether as a sort of national strategy it's worth, worth doing it as against alternative um, uses of those funds. So it would be useful to have your comment on that. The other th thing that I think is a, is a little bit, it's not problematic, but it's something to think about is, is really what, what's the sort of theory of conflict in this? Because um, and, and this affects your, your degree to get predictions from this, which is obviously extremely useful, particularly from a UN perspective. I mean, if, if, we, if we look at the Horn of Africa, we know that conflicts over land and water and other environmental resources goes you know, pretty deep back into history. Um, but then the, the conflicts that we saw over 50, 60 years in the Horn of Africa, which are, is a particularly conflict-prone area. Uh, you know, down to the failed or imperfect transition from colonialism, you know, the Cold War where you know, the United States and the Soviet Union went back and forth in their support for their different countries. I mean, Somalia is a sort of disaster in that way. The regional dynamics of conflict between the countries, Eritrea, versus sort of Ethiopia. Uh, all of this could, of course, feed into, you know, there's a terrible path dependence with this stuff, you know, feed into conflicts in the future, including any climate-related conflict or one that's initiated by climate change. But I'd be sort of interested in your observations about how we kind of bring in these other historical, political, <coughs> socioeconomic dimensions into the, this as a kind of predictive or or planning tool. In the, in the <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I think the issue of governance is the major problem, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, in particular in the Horn. Uh, for instance, if you take the case of uh, land grabbing problem, uh, which is an emerging threat in this area, especially in Ethiopia and other parts of Africa, uh, which is affecting heavily uh, the woodland and the forest resources, and in the meantime contributing for the emission of huge amount of carbon because of this land use conversion for uh, monocrop and other 
uh, type of uh, <coughs> non-perennial crops. So how do you, what is your reflection on this land grabbing problem? Because I haven't heard about that because it's critical in, in, in African context. That is one problem. And the other is concerning to regional instability, uh, management of the watershed areas. Uh, for instance, in the case of uh, Nile Basin area, uh, <coughs> where more than nine, uh, nine countries are uh, stakeholder in that area. And now, for instance, Ethiopia is planning to construct huge dam for uh, hydropower and other purpose. But some of the Nile Basin uh, countries are object objecting this idea because they think that the water volume may decline and that will affect the overall economy and other activity of this country. Then how you see uh, uh, the management of natural resources in the view of uh, maintaining stability in these areas? Thank you. More from any uh, any side. Here we go. Okay. Um, my name is Gariso. I'm from the University of Botswana in Southern Africa. Uh, my question is for Josh. Uh, please, could you uh, define what you mean by politically discriminated groups? Because there were some countries that came up that I was not even aware that um, this was a problem in. And uh, could you tell us where the data came from? Let's do Adam, and, and then and then we'll uh, Adam's right there. We go, and then we'll move on. And then then we'll we'll let them respond. Otherwise, we'll all forget what the questions were. Uh, Adam Slosser from MIT. First, thank you all for really interesting, um, thought-provoking presentations. My question is probably an extension of of uh, the question from the gentleman over there from Wider, which is uh, you showed a lot of compelling maps on the spatial variability and in the climate community, when we think about prediction, we also have to think about temporal variabilities, time scales of variability, and particular persistence. And I'm just wondering, do you have a sense of, from these metrics, what sort of, what are, what are the, what are the sort of the fundamental or, or representative time scales of these? I mean, I know we're thinking about this as an abstraction, and you have one indice, so it's really hard to get traction on it, but in terms of trying to think of something as a prediction, and as a result of some of one of your controlling factors, there's something coming out of the noise. Uh, when we think about climate change impacts, we really do have to think about things like time scales and the, and, and the extent of that variability in time. So I'm just wondering if you have a sense on that. Okay. Let me just summarize. So we had a, a question on roads and road data. Um, Tony speaking about projects, investments, those overlays and, and the issues associated with that. Uh, I'll summarize by saying a theory of conflict, uh, in a two-part question there. Um, uh, issues of governance was brought up in, in the back, and, and then uh, one that I, I find particularly fascinating, the, the you know, Nile River Basin Initiative and the hydropower issues in, in that region. Um, something just on politically discriminated uh, groups, and then Adam on, on uh, persistence. So uh, I'll just let the panel work this out. Let me take first crack, and I might say something about all of them and then see if my colleagues want to weigh in as well. In terms of road data, our initial effort uh, tried to uh, incorporate that data, and this was something that came up in one of the panels yesterday uh, that's uh, used some of the road data in, uh, from other sources. We had a data set that on roads that we thought might give us some traction, except a category one road in the DRC might be a dirt path, whereas uh, same category road in uh, South Africa would be a 10-lane highway and then a Cat 2 road was actually like a multi-lane paved road in South Africa. But if we wanted to just look at comparable categories, uh, the, it was sort of apples and oranges. So our map would make it look like if we just mapped all the Cat 1 roads, it made it look like the DRC had much better access to do service delivery in times of emergency than it actually possessed. And so we kind of thought, well, we can't use this. And, uh, and so we were kind of waiting until uh, someone came along with better data. Um, but we're sort of aware of that, we just haven't found traction. And there's some other things to get at local capacity, maybe um, 
uh, lights at night um, is another, you know, but then obviously in the midst of an emergency, you might imagine a lot of things shut down. So we're trying to figure out, you know, we tried to map airports uh, and again, some similar problems. So that sort of dropped out, but we can imagine that those are important. Uh, on rates of return, uh, this issue, um, yeah, you know, I'm a little agnostic. I kind of basically said, you know, you can't, you have trouble doing, imagining service delivery and like the absorptive capacity of, of countries that are unable to receive these resources is a kind of a, a similar phenomenon. So you might imagine that there's a kind of triaging that would take place like, well, let's invest in the places that we know will spend it well. But these are the actually, it's kind of, you know, we know that the problem areas are over here, but we know we can actually spend the money over there. So we're going to spend the money in Kenya and Tanzania because even if they don't have the bulk of the problems, uh, we can imagine that, 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 the, the, that the resources are going to be mobilized more effectively. And I think that's going to be a perennial dilemma. Uh, you know, in some places, and maybe these aren't those ones, but you can imagine in low-lying countries in, the, in, the, in Asia, uh, um, there are going to be some fundamental choices about um, uh, do we need to move populations that some of the island countries are facing at the moment. And so that's a, a similar trade-off, like do we invest in this physical space or do we think about investing in these people wherever they live? And I don't have a good answer for that, but I think those are fundamental challenges. Now this related question about the theory of conflict, um, you, you know, some of our <coughs> colleagues work on that quite actively and this field is has, uh, you know, there, there are so, these notions that, the, that have been popularized that there are going to be water wars and, you know, that any changes in uh, precipitation are inexorably going to lead to war. We, we have some anecdotal evidence, but most of the econometric work in this space actually suggests that there have been few to no water wars, that this is something, these are problems that are often resolved peacefully. And um, there's more evidence of, you know, times in which um, there's more precipitation are actually ones that are more conflict prone because there's more to fight over and then in drought times people are kind of hunkering down in survival mode. So, you know, we have a, a slightly different emphasis in our maps because we're interested in places where a large number of people could be exposed to mass death. And so that gets at large scale humanitarian tragedies that may divert militaries from doing other things to focus on humanitarian assistance, whether they're domestic or international militaries. And so it's a slightly different theory about where the security consequences come from. Um, but we're, we're sort of agnostic about, you know, that may or may not develop and turn into conflict, but it's, I think it suggests a, a different way uh, security communities ought to conceptualize this problem and not over-dramatize the extent to which physical scarcity is inexorably going to lead to violent conflict. Um, we haven't really done much on this land grabbing governance issue. Um, I, I, we're aware of it, and I just don't know how it intersects with what's going on here. I just know that in, you know, we have to be aware that in particular circumstances, there'll be the kinds of uh, problems that we've illustrated, and then that may take some of the adaptive capacity off the table if governments have somehow ceded their land to some foreign investor to grow some product for export. And so I think it could feed into some tensions, uh, particularly at the political level, as governments uh, respond to domestic political pressure to oust maybe some of these foreign investors, as we've seen in a number of countries. But I don't know exactly how to come to terms with that in a spatial geographic sense, other than uh, uh, maybe we, if someone had maps of where the land grabs are happening, uh, I'd be happy to overlay them uh, and that could provide another area where we think of uh, contiguous areas of land grabbing nearby in which there's um, a concentration of vulnerability, we might imagine that those populations are going to respond if, if, if the, the, the good areas of, that are being grabbed for expropriation for investors are uh, off limits for adaptation purposes. Um, let me quickly on the managing water resources. Um, uh, I think uh, some of the class that I led a couple of years ago did a kind of basin specific analysis of vulnerability because, you know, if we, if we just look at a country context or do a wider geographic lens, it might not bring into relief uh, the kinds of river basin specific uh, ways of looking at these optics. And I think the, the deeper dives that we can do with our work or people can do with our work to look at um, how 
uh, river basins can be managed for adaptation purposes because one, one of the strongest findings of this literature on, uh, on, on conflict and, and security is that uh, uh, river basin cooperative initiatives are one of the best ways to avoid um, the scarcity uh, related uh, episodes turning into conflict. So I, I think that's really important. Um, quickly on this politically discriminated, uh, it's the GEO EPR data set. Uh, it's the uh, ethnic political relations data set. It's available uh, on uh, a Harvard website. Anybody emails me and I can send you the details. And they basically look at whether or not a particular ethnic group in a, lo in a particular location is uh, represented in government um, and, and, w and whether or not the government has actually targeted them to kind of withhold services from them. And, uh, but I, I might be, since it's not something that we collected ourselves, I might be mangling um, how they classify it. But they also have other categories like politically irrelevant groups or um, politically there's another category where they're not actively discriminated against, they're just ignored. And we, we map those two dimensions as well to get at uh, groups that might not uh, be actively targeted by the government, but they just might not have representation in the government uh, and might not actually get services in the time of need. Uh, and I won't say anything about temporal timescales because I've gone on a long time as it is. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues to answer any or all of these comments. Sorry, I just wanted to pick up a little bit on the on the the, the theory of the theory of conflict. Uh, there was a, and the well, to jump ahead a little bit, the, there was a great paper in the Journal of Peace Research, uh, special edition in January, on that did a similar vulnerability analysis, but at the river basin scale, and uh, the authors, the names of the authors escape me at the moment, but. Um, uh, if you're particularly interested in river basins, then you might check that out. That same special issue of JPR did a lot of work on this theory of conflict, on where, how do we link climate changes to, to conflict. Um, and as, as Josh pointed out, uh, there's not a lot of evidence of water wars, and uh, pastoralist conflicts get a lot of, uh, of attention, um, and I've done a little bit of work on that along with uh, some of our other colleagues. Um, and. Uh, Idiosyncratically, we know that it happens, right? We know that, that they, there are instances of, of these type of pastoral conflicts are happening or pastoralist versus agriculturalist conflicts happening. It's very difficult to find statistical evidence that, that changes in rainfall um, or climatic changes are a driver of that. Um, uh, so there, I think that there are other causal mechanisms behind it, and one that I believe that I've done a little bit of work on is, is, is food prices and uh, using, and this is where we've, I focus more on uh, strikes and riots on SCAD, the Social Conflict in Africa data set that was developed by Aideen Salayan and, and Cullen Hendricks, our colleagues, versus the armed conflict, people shooting each other. Um, but we know that these type of strikes and riots can explode into, into larger scale um, political conflicts, which may be sometimes good, in fact. But uh, that, that aside, I've recently found evidence that, that dry times lead to increases in food prices, which lead to, to social conflict. Uh, I don't find, although, and, and periods of abundance, rainfall abundance, lead to a decrease in food prices, but they still lead to social conflict. So that's not the causal mechanism there that's work at, at work there. Now, like I said, scarcity, high prices, conflict. S somehow, somehow uh, rainfall abundance is leading to um, uh, social conflict through a different mechanism that we're still struggling to figure out. Now, I don't know if it's floods, if it's, if it's competition over resource, uh, available resources, like perhaps what we saw in Pakistan a couple of years ago. I don't know, but uh, we're still struggling with that. The names of the authors on that paper are, where are they? Uh, De Stefano, Duncan, is De, St De Stefano at all? I'm just going to comment briefly on the land grabbing question because I think this is an issue that becomes really important when we're thinking about mainstreaming climate change policies or mainstreaming disaster risk management policies. So if we just take the example of Mozambique, this is a place where I heard, I had people telling me Yes, the government is very focused on disaster risk management. We have this organization. This is what they do. They organize everything. They deal with all the NGOs, very organized, at least centrally, if not in remote parts of the country. 
At the same time, I have people telling me about all kinds of new natural resources that are being discovered, contracts over those, the role of the government and government actors in their interests in these contracts, and that there are obvious risks associated with investment in and exploration of natural resources and risks for new um, natural hazards and effects of climate change down the line. So I think these are issues that absolutely have to be taken into consideration when we think about whether or not a country is really comprehensively dealing with climate change or dealing with disaster risk management. And it's not simply enough to say that, yes, there is a policy in place to deal with this particular issue. It really is about incorporating that into policies across the board within a country. And that's the, the kind of attitude that I think is being promoted, but it's not necessarily being adopted explicitly on the ground to deal with these issues. I wanted to say something about time scales since, because uh, uh, you asked that question. So, you know, we, we have a, a, our sort of chronic maps that we anticipate in the future might be the places that are uh, vulnerable based on historic vulnerability. Now we have these 2050 projections of future physical exposure. How do we, what, what, how do we make those kinds of different stories uh, sync up with each other? Well, one of the things that we're trying to do with our climate modeling colleagues is they have simulations of present day, we have 2050 uh, 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 predictive um, uh, scenarios. Can, can we see about the pathways of what are the intermediate steps of, of physical exposure that we're likely to see by 2030 or 2020? One of the problems is, is that climate scientists have until recently been loath to do these kinds of 2050 um, scenarios, let alone 2020 ones. It took a, a lot of work for us to convince them that the policy community needs shorter term uh, uh, scenarios uh, and trajectories than, uh, than 2080 and 2100, which is typical among climate scientists. So we got them to 2050, but it's harder to move closer in. So our expectations uh, you know, for particular places are in the future between now and you know, the, the, the you know, lifetime of concern for the policymaking community that has pretty short-term time horizons, but being able to say with any precision about how, how soon those consequences are likely to manifest themselves is, is not really something that we're able to say other than you should focus your attention there and the problems are likely to manifest sometime uh, in the horizon that you care about, which is, you know, 10 to 20 years. Okay, let's take uh, uh, three pointed questions from the left-hand side of the room. Uh, Felix. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that was a good presentation. My major challenge is the generalization of what is happening in Africa. Um, it was good that you picked data by the sub-regions. And my question is, if you had analyzed this, what you did by the sub-regions, I don't think you might get that conclusions that is coming out. Because, I mean, a simple example of the generalization is um, the example you just gave your last uh, response, that when uh, in the dry season, food prices goes up and leads to conflict. Um, the countries in Africa has different ecological zones and different resources and arrangements for off-season activities. So when such a generalization comes, it becomes that there are some hotspots you might, you can conclude that, but that, there are very, very few uh, places that you can make that conclusion. But my question is, if you had done this analysis, especially for the last presentation, on regional basis, was, was some of these conclusions be the same? Next. Uh, Tony has one over here if there's not one more on the, on the left. Okay. You have one more? Okay. Go ahead, Tony. It, it's uh, just coming back to this, this, this point about the causes of conflict because the um, broadly conflict, schools of thought about conflict fall into sort of two explanations. One is that, you know, it's really complex. You've got to be deeply historical, et cetera, et cetera. The other is that we can just cut out all of that and we can look for economic growth or lack of it as a source of conflict. Inequality is a source of conflict. You know, we now have climate change as a source of conflict. 
food price is a source of conflict. So you, you just pick the kind of one. And that, that's kind of deeply attractive because, you know, then we don't have to kind of explore the, the, the whole complexity of the societies. But, but we also know it's actually quite dangerous <laughs> in a prescriptive sense because not only can um, foreign policy um, departments but also militaries, uh, international organizations read the wrong conclusions from all of that. So, you know, I, I just sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to your, to your, to your approach because an, as an economist, I'm looking for the simplest explanations possible. But on the other hand, the, my understanding of some of these conflicts, particularly in the, in the countries that you're pursuing, is that they are deeply historical and very uh, context uh, specific. Uh, if, if I was going to make a question, but I'd, I'd actually uh, talk to you over coffee about this, it would be um, whether your model would actually explain what happened in New Orleans in, uh, whenever it was when that, the big flood disaster occurred. Because, you know, there is a rich society which didn't cope at all well. And, um, you know, can we actually predict these kinds of things for, for African societies in the way that you conceptualize it? But maybe over coffee. Thank you very much. Uh, Fintar from UNU Wider. Uh, mine is a little bit more of a comment or a couple of suggestions than a very pointed uh, question. But um, as somebody uh, who was basically the person who started the, the disaster risk management system in Mozambique, this is obviously extremely interesting in the late 70s. Um, and I would also say that as somebody who sort of tried to grapple with predicting some of the crises in Burundi and Rwanda based on FAO land scarcity uh, data and so on. Um, th th this, this is of course incredibly interesting because this adds a, a whole slew of dimensions to these things which are absolutely fascinating. Um, my, my sort of maybe suggestion is that implicit in quite a bit of what you were talking about, both when it came to the sort of aid allocation uh, but also when you're talking about the moral hazard, uh, there are some links to the uh, literature on foreign aid, which I'm not sure. Uh, you, you, you are, maybe you are, maybe you're not aware of it, but there are some very strong links to part of the core discussions about foreign aid, aid effectiveness and so on, which, which I would suggest that we might want to just discuss a little bit more in depth. Uh, one example. Um, is that you have very influential literature on uh, aid effectiveness suggesting where returns might be high, but which have then uh, emerging out of the World Bank and so on, but which have then subsequently shown not to stand up. And it touches on, on exactly this issue of rate of return. Are you having the highest rates of return in bad conditions or in good conditions? Potentially you can have them you can have high rate of returns in, in pretty bad conditions because if capital is scarce and you put capital into, I mean, th there is actual literature on these things which I think it could be quite fascinating. We're trying to link up with what you were doing. And uh, on the moral hazard uh, question, let me just say that this is a, I mean, it's, it's an absolutely first class example of trying to dig into something that the aid literature is suffering terribly from. We are suffering terribly from the fact that theoretical hypotheses become accepted as empirically validated before they have actually been empirically validated. And, and, and I would just really strongly encourage you to push this as much as you can because th this can help change that literature in, 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 in a strong direction. Um, I was a little bit sort of pondering, and I'll finish now. Uh, on, on the one hand, uh, Josh sort of spoke about all the data and, and, and Todd as well, and then uh, Jennifer was kind of talking about uh, questionable quantitative data. And I was sort of wondering whether you might want to elaborate just a little bit, but that was. And then finally, uh, uh, just, and this is just to make a point, which I hope you won't uh, take its defensive. You and you wider is not subject to political pressures in our research. Just. Absolutely not. We get zero dollars from the UN. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, please go ahead and, and a lot of discussion in the questions, but, but uh, some quick answers here. 
Right, so first, I, I uh, thank you very much for the question about the, the rainfall season, and I need to clarify uh, a couple of points. One, I did not mean to suggest that UN University was was in any way uh, 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 had uh, was political beholding to anybody. Especially um, since we're funded by the Defense Department, and people would make the same assumption. Yeah. Uh, Who wants to talk? <laughs> But a few weeks ago, we, uh, Professor, Professor uh, Robert Wilson and I were, were in uh, Nairobi visiting with UN Habitat. And they, they are funded directly by, by countries. And they are, do have political constraints on what they can and can't say. So I think that, uh, let me be clear that I, that's, I didn't mean UNU. I meant other UN organizations. Uh, on the, uh, the, the, uh, also, I need to clarify that this is a danger about trying to summarize a completely different paper that I was working on in about 30 seconds. Um, I, I didn't mean to suggest that, that, that prices go up during dry seasons, because they don't. Uh, the, the rainfall uh, measure that I was using in that paper was a difference from long-term mean, so uh, in, partic in individual countries. So uh, when a country, whether it's the dry season or the wet season, gets less rainfall than they expect based on long-term long patterns, that's when 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 uh, when prices go up, or when prices go down. It's uh, uh, you're you're absolutely right that countries are adapted to uh, to various conditions, um, and I, I tried to tried to deal with that in the paper. But uh, that is something that that we definitely need to be more nuanced about. And I think that these maps are just one tool, and they're a tool. And the maps are a very powerful tool, and they can get people to sit down around coffee or around a conference table or whatever and talk about that, these things. But they, they're, they're also a static picture and it is important to bring in historical perspectives and uh, perspe cultural perspectives and other tools uh, that other people have talked about here. And, and so we, we also don't mean to suggest that these maps are the end all be all and just point to the place on the map where, where that is red and put a project there. That's, that, that's, not the, that's not good either. So. Well, I'm going to take the um, chair's prerogative and um, call an end to this session. Thank you very much to the speakers. Mm -hmm.